So I want to welcome everyone again. It's uh, really exciting that you're all joining me this evening, this evening in Modi'in and, and whatever time it might be where you are, where you're from. Um, my name is Perry. Uh, as of last week, I am the uh, new appointed director of the Tali Education System in Israel. And I was very happy to be asked to lead a session. Uh, we, I titled the session Between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and um, by, through examining a couple of, uh, of texts, uh, I want to talk about um, some of Tali's educational philosophy with you this evening, this morning. Uh, before we get started, what I'd like to do is whip around the virtual room and everyone uh, could introduce themselves and say their name and where they're from. Uh, this is going to be an interactive session. I don't lecture. So what I hope we experience this morning uh, is, is an educational experience akin to what we run in our educational workshops for teachers and other learners at Tali. Um, we're going to make the most of the digital platform. We'll try to integrate some other technologies as well. We'll walk through them together. And Sarah Levy, who is in one of the windows right in front of me, just raised her hand. She's uh, co-moderating the session with me, so she can go around and uh, unmute people so that they can talk. And after we've whipped around the room, I'll go, go, uh, I'll go through some um, Zoom rules I like to use in sessions, and then we'll get started. So, uh, Sarah, why don't you unmute people in the order which you see them, okay? Okay. Um, cool. I'm muting myself. No, I can't and, hear you. Uh, you're on mute. All right, uh, Rena, nope. you're up. Sarah. Okay, I've got, I've got Rena in the corner. Would you like to? Would you like to introduce yourself, Rena? And sitting next to me is Rena and Fred Safer. We live in Jerusalem. We made Aliyah three years ago from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Great, thank you, Rena. Welcome. Thank you. I've got a Cohen. Not working. I'm I'm trying I'm trying to unmute you, but uh, there's uh I don't know what's hmm. with the, the settings. Okay, if this doesn't work, then we won't. Okay, uh, uh, she can hear us, but we can't hear her. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Jacob Siegel. Sorry. Hi. Hello. Hi, Dad. Hello, sweetie. I made a mistake. Yes. Hi. We're going to mute that one. <laughs> Hello? Hi, Jacob. Hi. And do it again. Okay, you know what? Let's, um, the technology doesn't always work in our favor. Let's do this. We have a chat box. Uh, for those who haven't been in many Zoom conversations in during Corona, even though I think we're all pretty much Zoomed out. If you go to the bottom of your Zoom window, um, you should be able to click on chat, and a chat window will open up next to this big black screen where you can all type uh, messages to the entire group or to each other. And that's another way hey for us to communicate. I heard uh, someone. Am I uh, unmuted? Yep, you are unmuted. Okay. Um, okay, so I want to tell you a little bit more about myself. I have been in um, Jewish education basically for my entire career. I've worked in uh, many educational settings, both in Israel and in the United States, from Camp Ramah, different Ramah camps, uh, through youth work, work with um, through youth work, adult education, Hebrew school. Uh, I founded Limud in Modi'in and ended up in Tali about three years ago. Uh, I earned my master's degree from the Dave, William Davidson School in, uh, at JTS and um, a doctorate in Midrash from the graduate, graduate school at the Jewish, Jewish Theologi Theological Seminary. And like I said, what I want to do this evening is talk about a couple of core concepts in Tali education um, and experience uh, a session with you. Uh, like I said, it's going to be more interactive. So the introductions didn't work so well, but we're not going to we're not going to lose hope there. Um, 
In the bottom of the window, you have a little icon that says reaction. You could clap like I just did, or you could do a thumbs up. And I'd like to use that as raising hands. So if anyone wants to say something throughout the, uh, the session, please feel free to use the reactions or type in the chat box and um, either Sarah or Anya Siegel, my colleagues, will alert me to the fact that someone wants to say anything. Hi, Anya. Okay. Um, so we're going to get going. And I am po posting, this is our first challenge, I'm posting in the chat box a link. What I'd like you to do with that link is click on it and paste it in your browser. Whether you use Google or Yahoo, you can click on the link, right click on the link, copy it, and paste it in your browser. If anyone has trouble doing that, please raise your hand. You should see a window open up with a question on the top. It says answer garden. And there's a question, a prompt, which is what comes to mind when you think of Tel Aviv? Okay, you nod if you see that. Okay, so anyone who's reached that window can start answering the question. Think of one or two words, maximum three phrases that come to mind when you think of Tel Aviv. And you can type them in, in the answer bar, and just hit send. OK, is anyone having trouble with that? Do we have to troubleshoot anything? You all look very, yes, Carol. Yes, I'm having trouble. OK, can you um, write, what did you say? You can, oh, Anya says you can just left click and paste. If you click on, the, on that link, it should open up a window. Who's having trouble? Melvin? Yeah. Did you I'm get it? I'm having trouble. I try to go to chat. It says alternate H. I press that and get nothing. You get nothing. OK, so if you can't click on that, write your answers in the chat, and we will copy, copy and paste them into the, into the relevant window. So what comes to mind when you think of, or when you hear Tel Aviv? Anya and, and Sarah, if you can take things from the chat and transfer them. The beach. Them. Melvin? The beach. The beach. Also the restaurants along the beach. Okay. And so, all the excitement there. Okay. Everyone should be typing in and I will add the things that you've just said. Okay. I'm going to share my window with you so you can see what's going on. You can, everyone else, you can keep typing in that window. You can keep adding in answers. You should now all be able to see my screen. Okay, we have quite a few people wrote beach, a couple of people wrote secular. Give it another minute or two. Is everyone else okay with this? Anya, Sarah? Are there things, things appearing in the chat, Sarah? Here we have been copying and pasting things from chat. Excellent. And we're pretty much that done. Okay. Add another couple of words. 
Okay. I'm adding gay. L A wannabe. <laughs> Good one. And uh, modernity, vibrant, my favorite beaches. And I think we're I think we're done. Okay. Excellent. Oh wow. Okay. Wait a minute. I Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing that for a moment. We're gonna go back to that for a minute. Okay, was that okay for everyone? Okay, so now what I'd like to do is the same activity, the same game, and I'm posting a different prompt. I'm doing the same thing. So you can click on it in the chat. And if you have trouble clicking on it, just type in the chat and Anya and Sarah could help you with it. Okay, so the prompt this time is, what comes to mind when you think of Jerusalem? The holy city. Okay. The western wall. Hey, are people going through it? I don't know where to type it. All I can do is say it. Then say it. Go for it. The, the, the Western Wall. We got, we got that. The religi religiosity of the city. Hey. Okay, we have a lot of kotel here. Holy city, Western Wall, the Western Wall, religious city, Shabbat crowded, religious, religiosity, religious. While we're waiting, I have a question for Herbert Rosenblum. My mother's maiden name was Rosenblum. Did your family come from Romania by any chance? Okay, question for Herbert Rosenblum, type it in the chat, okay? And we are done. We're done, okay, so I'm gonna share that screen for those who couldn't get there on their own. On the end. So, and this is our word cloud for Jerusalem. Okay, I'm gonna put them both up so we can see them together. Second, oh, and what? My next question for you is, what can we learn from comparing these two word clouds? So here's one, wait a minute. Again, you can raise your hand and we will unfreeze, unmute, or type in the chat box. Either way is great. Either way is great today. You've got to do some of the work. You've got to carry some of the weight in the session. Okay, so here are our two. Wait, I'm stopping to share that, and I'm going to share another window with you, and we can see it together. Stop share, share screen. Here we go. Okay. Can you guys all see the two, the two word clouds we created? Oh, one of them is overlapping the other. Fix that and share it. Okay. So, does anyone want to um, reflect on these word clouds before we continue? Similarities, differences. Okay, I'm gonna move on. We're gonna keep them in mind for later. So what I'd like to do now is share a couple of poems with you and we'll read through them together. Um, the first poem is a poem by Yehuda Michai. And for some reason, I haven't shared it with you. Let's see. Sorry. Let's go. Thank you. 
The first poem is a poem by Yehuda Michai. Yehuda Michai is one of the most famous poets, uh, most well-known poets in Israel, and he's most widely translated into uh, most, most languages. He was born in Germany in 1924, and he made, uh, he immigrated to Palestine in 1936, died in, in 2000. He grew up religious and then uh, became secular as an adult. Um, his poems are magic. He was a magician of words. He integrated modern Hebrew with biblical Hebrew, Talmudic Hebrew with classical Hebrew, and really he, his poems are a tapestry of, of um, the beautiful language and, and they paint very vivid pictures um, many times about, of Jerusalem, uh, and of uh, Israeli culture. Uh, the poem that I've shared with you this evening is called The Ecology of Jerusalem, which I'd like to read through together. The air over Jerusalem is saturated with prayers and dreams, like the air over industrial cities. It's hard to breathe. And from time to time, a new shipment of history arrives and the houses and towers are its packing materials. Later, these are discarded and piled in dumps. And sometimes candles arrive instead of people, and then it's quiet. And sometimes people come instead of candles, and then there's noise. And in enclosed gardens, heavy with jasmine, foreign consulates, like wicked brides that have been rejected, lie in wait for their moment. I want to go through it again and, and uh, kind of tease it apart a little bit. The air over Jerusalem is saturated with prayers and dreams. It's saturated. Such a heavy word. Saturated. Things are saturated with fat. It's not a very positive connotation, at least not in my, uh, in my world. Saturated with prayers and dreams. Heavy, laden. The air weighs down on the city of Jerusalem. Like the air over an industrial city, it's hard to breathe, like smog. And from time to time, new shipments of history arrive. History happens to the city. It arrives. It arrives packages. Houses and towers are its packing material. History arrives and is packed in architecture, art, and later these are discarded and piled in dumps. We're not kind to history. We're not kind to history and we, uh, maybe we're even disrespectful of history. And sometimes candles arrive instead of people and then it's quiet. Like your type candles, memorial candles. There are more candles than people. Sometimes it feels that way. And sometimes people come instead of candles and then it's noise and then there's noise. And in enclosed gardens heavy with jasmine, heavy with a foreign with a foreign scent, foreign consulates, like wicked brides that have been rejected, lie in wait for their moment. For their moment to do what? There's something very nag. sorry, say that again. To nag. To nag. To nag. To impose. To impose, does anyone else have any reactions? Oh, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Any other reactions to this poem? You can chat it. Yes, you can I, raise your hand. Yeah, Gil. I, I just put it in chat, but definitely the first line is uh, to contradict uh, what Naomi Shemer uh, begins. Avir harim talul payain, the, the clear air of the mountain air of Jerusalem. No, toda, Gil, right. Nomi Shema writes of Jerusalem, the city of gold, and how the air is so free and clear and, and breathable. And he comes and he like slashes that. He says the air is something you can't breathe. It's like smog. It's so heavy. It's so hot. It's so dense. Thanks, Gil. Does anyone else have anything, any reactions to that poem, to Amichai's take on Jerusalem? Well, I live in Jerusalem, so I am, I am perhaps not objective enough. Uh, I don't have the benefit of being at a distance from it. The poem feels incredibly contemporary, very modern and very relevant. 
okay. even though it was written, I don't know if it was written 1987 or, or, or before, right. but Probably it feels today. like it could have been written today. Right, yeah, yeah. Thanks to them. There seems also to be a strong connection between, in this poem, between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Hi, Cheryl. Hi. Uh, the heaviness of the air in a different sense. The, the context is different, but the feeling can be very similar. Um, Tel Aviv is saturated with something else that makes the air hard to breathe. Maybe the, the you know, the smog or the industrial components or whatever. Mm. And um, they're just, there seems to be a link here between the two cities. Spoken from a true Jerusalemite. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Can add I can add a note that, that uh, it's very Jewish in the sense that it's it's speaking of polarity. You've got the prayers and the dreams, and you've got the foreign consulates. Mm -hmm. So you have the, you know you've got the secular and you've got the uh, the religious, and it, one without the other wouldn't be Jerusalem. I think the, it's so, even right. I think it's the same, more the same than element, the same element that comes into play with the candles. So mm -hmm. they're, 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 the can, they're both kinds of candles make up the totality of mm -hmm. what Jerusalem is. So Jerusalem is a is a conglomerate. It is a um, a totality uh, because it really reflects the totality of a, as it were, of a civilization, mm -hmm. which has all of the elements that make up a, a civilization, the different right. kinds of people and so on. But it's oh. more more than religious and secular. It, it's a multicultural city. Right. Hello. Hi. Hi, Dan. I have three Zooms going at the same time. Oh, my God. Um, so basically, what, you know, when I was looking at this line, sometimes the candles. When I think of the candles, I think, you know, of light. Mm. You know, things get a little bit brighter when we have the candles. And sometimes, instead of the people, we don't even need the people because the lights are so evanescent we can just go into ourselves and just think about the beauty of the candles and the warmth. Thank and then you. when it's sometimes people come instead of candles and then there's noise. So then the people are coming and they're being joyous and they're just thinking of being with each other, that it's not so much the candles that they need, but they can reflect an inner glow from each other. That's beautiful. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Anyone else? It's a very powerful poem. It's a very one powerful year, poem. Uh, one year I was in uh, both Jerusalem and Tel Aviv for Purim. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing the difference between the way the two are celebrated. And I'll never forget that. Right. In uh, Jerusalem, they were dressed up, the kids were dressed as Hasidim going through the streets, get, trying to get charity, while in Tel Aviv, they were with those plastic uh, hammers that look like knockers hitting each other on the head and uh, being joyous. Right. right. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Melvin, are you trying to say something? No. Okay, so, oh, sorry. I say the candles are, seems to me mainly as what we call ner neshama, that each candle is, uh, resembles the soul of a person, especially of a dead person. Right, that's, what, that's, what I, that's how I read it, that candles come instead of people. But, but I like Diane's take. Diane's take was a more positive take of the candles and the people. I think you can read it either way. Okay, so since we're talking about Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and uh, Cheryl and Har Cheryl juxtaposed them. Ooh, where did that come from? I am moving on to another poem. This one's a lot less known. It's a poem about Tel Aviv. And let's read through this one. This one's called A Tel Aviv Prayer by Eli Mohar. Eli Mohar um, is, uh, was a Hebrew uh, songwriter and columnist. And he's actually, he, he wrote um, a lot of the soundtrack of Israeli music. So a lot of Kaveret's music. He wrote for Eric Einstein. Uh, he wrote for, with Yoni Rechter. So a lot, of, a lot of the very popular Israeli songs. If you Google Eli Mohar, 
you'll you'll find that you know them, that you could sing them. This is a poem that's a lot a lot less known. Uh, and I thank Aura Mitkin Kanner for her translation. My God, here we have no Kotel. We have only the sea. But since you dwell in all places, surely you are here too. And so when I stroll the length of this beach, I know you are beside me and I'm good. When I suddenly see a tourist, lovely and tan, lying on the sand revealingly, I cast a quick glance and stop and wonder. And I trust you won't only forgive me, but you'll enjoy too. Surely I look for my own sake, but also a little for yours, because I know you are within me as I am within you. And perhaps I was created so that in me, you might see the world you created through fresh eyes. A Tel Aviv prayer. Maybe I'll let you you take it apart before I before I go through it. You can read it again, read it to yourselves. Maybe I'll, I'll tease it apart a little. We have no kotel, we only have the sea. If you live in Israel, like the religious people go to shul on Shabbat and the secular people go to the sea. Juxtaposing the kotel and the beach is setting up these two types of Israel, as it were, two archetypes of, of, uh, of uh, an Israeli Shabbat. The prayer and the beach, and yet the poem is called a Tel Aviv prayer. One of the reasons I like it. But since you dwell in all places, that resonates Heschel to me, surely you are here too. And so when I stroll the length of this beach, you think of the length of the Tel Aviv beach and I think of the length of the state of Israel, right? It's like when I stroll from north to south, from south to north like along the coast of the country, I know you are beside me. In my ear, that's Boober. And I'm good. I'm good. Maybe I'm good because I know you approve. Maybe I'm good because I know you're with me. I'm good. When I suddenly see a tourist, it struck, me in, it struck me in this week's Parsha and last week's Parsha, actually, the word suddenly appears in the Torah. Pitom. Something happens, pitom, suddenly. I see a tourist. In the Hebrew, it's very clearly a, fe a, fe a female tourist. In the English, it's uh, non-gendered. Lying on the sand revealingly, I cast a quick glance and stop and wonder. Again, that's Heschel, right? His radical amazement. And I trust you won't only forgive me, but you'll enjoy it too. A little wink, right? He's winking at, at uh, at God or at himself. Surely I look for my own sake, but also a little for yours, because I know you are within me as I am within you. And perhaps I was created so that in me, you might see the world you created through fresh eyes. I love it. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm interested to hear your reactions. Marion, I can't hear you. You have to unmute. I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. In modern English, the word good has a couple of different meanings. I'd like to know what it is in the Hebrew so I can understand it better in this poem. Okay, in the Hebrew he says, When I walk along the, uh, along the beach, All right, that's a, that's a different connotation than it is in the English. And every that's why it's so important to go back to the Hebrew. Often. Absolutely, every translation is an interpretation. Yep, right. You're right, the Hebrew is very clear. It makes him feel good about himself. But again, you can read it either way. Good about himself that he knows God's with him. Good about himself because he knows God's, God approves. Um, iPad 5, I don't have your name here. Yes, hi, I'm Lisa. And hi, I'm Lisa. Hi, I'm in Jerusalem. And so I would actually also ask, I'm also very taken by the last sentence, mm -hmm. but I would like that, I'd like to have that in Hebrew, in, if you could. 
the end, sure. perhaps. You know what? I yeah. will. I will. I will post it in the chat afterwards. I'll read it now. Uh, the last sentence. Ve'ulai bichlal nivreti kedei shemitochi tuchal lirot et haolam shebarata be'einaim chadashot. Yeah. Okay. That 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 translation strikes me as as, as pretty good into English. But um, yeah, I this I, this poem I actually um, appreciate more I think than the first one, and I think it's in part because for me, the beauty of you know having been an American Jew who is living in Israel, the fact that you can have a very rich Jewish life in a secular world is something that's very special to me. Um, that's something I do not think you can have, certainly where I was raised in South Carolina in the United States. If you were not an observant Jew, however you chose to observe, then you were not a Jew because you just were in a very Christian society. And so in my many iterations of being and living and working here in Israel, I have really come to appreciate even though I don't want to live in Tel Aviv and I choose to live in Jerusalem, the fact that I love Tel Aviv's secularness and Jewishness altogether or different interpretation of Jewishness is something that I think is extremely important and it's, I cherish it. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Yeah, Harvey. Hi. Yeah, hi. Uh, without it, I, I connect this poem, obviously it's very, very personal. Uh, Knowing the two cities, I, I, I look at I, I look at Tel, Tel Aviv and Yerushalayim as two different forms of revelation. Hmm. Uh, particularly here, the Tel Aviv prayer is coming to uh, sense God's presence through discovery. It's almost Kaplanian, uh, hmm. as opposed to a disclosure type of revelation, which is you associate, you know, with uh, with more of a of a traditional Jerusalem bent. So I see the two cities in this sense being contrast. And I, as you were reading it the first time, of course, I also thought of Heschel, that line, and that's directly from a 1929, when he was a very young man writing in Warsaw. Mm -hmm. And he's looking and he says, I see, I see God in myself and I see you and me. And it's, okay. it's, it, and I think that that line itself is open to, to multiple uh, interpretation as well. Any other comments before we move on? I'm just going to go through. There are a couple of screens here. Hi. Hi. Uh, uh, Mel Cerner. Yeah. Hi, Mel. I'm another Melvin here. There are two, but I, what struck me was a remembrance of about five or six years ago. I took a congregational trip as I did several times for 10 days to Israel. And uh, the first Shabbat, because we arrived Friday, the first Shabbat was in Tel Aviv. And like most, of course, the larger part, four or five days, were to be in Yerushalayim. This is, I think, in 2015. And Wednesday, Thursday, there was a weather threat of an extreme snowstorm uh, in Yerushalayim. And the, the issue, as I recall, was that, of course, if the plane goes, departs on Saturday night, and you're not there, you forfeit your flight. So our, an awesome decision our group had to decide, I thought I shouldn't do that unilaterally, should we stay in Yerushalayim with the risk of being snowed in, or spend the second Shabbat in Tel Aviv, very unusual for a uh, trip, which included some first timers. Uh, the group voted 14 to 12, something like that, and four extensions. So we, we went to Tel Aviv on Friday. Uh, but the, the whole comment is, as a result, uh, I and the group, we spent Shabbat services at the Schechter, uh, at the uh, Schechter uh, uh, Institute uh, branch, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, which turned out to be very moving on a lot of grounds, including the fact there was a bar mitzvah. But it reminded me that that's part of Tel Aviv too, uh, that some of the challenges we face, meaning three times the rabbi had to ask the people not to take photographs during the service. 
uh, many of the people dressed extremely informally for uh, right and uh, so you had people in our movement attempting to bring many people together but more important on the way back I distinctly recall those memories have stuck with me we had a long walk back to our, to our hotel mm -hmm. and I would say 12 noon out of nowhere there were 25 to 50 people who showed up for Riku de Am. I don't know where they came from. Obviously, they knew yeah. that it was 12 o'clock. At 10 yeah. to 12, there was nobody there. At 12 under, under, the, underneath the Crown Plaza Hotel on the beach in Tel Aviv, ah. every Shabbat. Thank you. And in another place uh, closer to the water, at first I thought they were stone, uh, but it turned out they were largely Asian people who were meditating or doing yoga. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were many other sites, including along the beach, uh, people strolling. But it was reminded, I thought we had a very enriched and very different Shabbat experience, which uh, taps into what a few other people had, uh, as opposed to Jewish right. Hawaiian. All, right. all of my personal visits, I usually spend three quarters of the time in Jewish Hawaiian. I, th and, I, and think, I think, I think we, have, we have these, um, these very uh, black and white images of Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Where, when actually there's gray in both Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. You could find secular Israel in Jerusalem and you can find different forms of religiosity in, in Tel Aviv. And actually over, over the past, I guess, decade or decade and a half, it, it's become more and more colorful, more and more diverse. It's very, very refreshing, colorful. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, so um, uh, I brought these two poems. Initially, this session was supposed to take place a week before um, Yom Yerushalayim. Uh, the day that in Israel we mark the reunification of, of uh, the city of Jerusalem, and and uh, and that's why I decided to talk about about Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, and maybe shy away from the the uh, the way most Israelis celebrate um, Yom Yerushalayim. Uh, but after it was postponed, I decided to stay with this because I see the juxtaposition of these two uh, poems as a gateway for talking about Tali education. Because in many ways, uh, Tali, Tali educational philosophy puts us, if you want, on Kvish Mispalachat, on the main highway from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, connecting the Jerusalem paradigm of revelation or of Judaism with the Tel Aviv par paradigm of Israeli Judaism. And therefore, these two, these two poems, these two, uh, um, uh, these two poets can kind of open up our discussion about that. Um, we worked very hard in Tali. We encourage all our learners from the youngest uh, students in preschool, but mostly the adult learners, the teachers, the educators, the principals, uh, to embrace both the tradition and um, a tradition with all its riches, the texts, the stories, the, the, uh, the history, but also um, marry that, wed that to modern thought, to modern values, to modern Israel, to humanism, to pluralism, to all the all the uh, uh, all the isms um, we hold so dearly, uh, we encourage them to grapple with the tensions between the Jerusalem model of Judaism and the Tel Aviv model of Judaism. Right? Not not to uh, not to see them as black and white. Not to embrace one and throw out the other, but to look for the things that they find interesting and exciting and engaging in both models in order to create, in order to weave a Judaism, an Israeli Judaism, modern Judaism that speaks to them and that they could, um, they could truly feel that they own and they, can, uh, and they can find their own voice. They can find their own voice within our tradition, one that they can transmit and educate the next generation. Um, one of the fun, we have eight. Tali has eight fundamental values that we that we work uh, that we work through. And one of the one of the fundamental values is tradition, exploration, and rejuvenation. Okay, so we encourage our learners to explore, to enrich their Jewish literacy, to explore different texts, to challenge uh, their intellect, but to also um, read these sources critically. And find ways to rejuvenate their uh, their Judaism, their lives, their culture, um, and just like Judaism throughout history, what contributed a lot to Western civilization. Judaism also knew how to glean 
and identify values that other cultures have, that other communities have, and integrate them into what's become the Judaism that we love and we embrace today. And that's what we want our learners and our teachers to do. Um, and some people say that if you look around Israel, we're witnessing a tragedy. And the tragedy is that um, in their attempt to create the new Jew, the Tzabar, the, uh, the new Israeli, many, many of our uh, founding fathers kind of threw out everything that smelt, that whiffed of religiosity um, and created a, an Israeli society that is largely ignorant of the Judaism that we like, that we love. Uh, and there are a lot of organizations that have um, kind of sprung up alongside Tali over the past 40 years when we've been around, and we're all working to try and re reinvigorate, reimagine, and, um, and, uh, and breathe life into Israeli Judaism so that Judaism doesn't remain a religious artifact that sits on a shelf and that's, uh, that's largely, um, I guess, uh, um, uh, associated with a certain with a certain stream with a certain flavor um there's a there's a saying that um Yaakov Chazan who was one of the founders of Mapam the communist party in 1948 he said we wanted to raise a generation of epikorsim and we raised a generation of ignoramuses of amehatzot so we worked very hard in order to overturn to overturn that and kind of bring the uh uh, um, re recreate our our uh, present in order to have a more rich and uh, and um, I guess a, a rich future that can be connected with the Judaism of diaspora. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, Harry. yeah. Oh. I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, you know, I'm so happy you're speaking about this because this is one of the reasons that I'm so involved with the Hillel's in Israel for so many years, because the most important thing, we just don't want to have these, to have Israelis, we want to have Jewish Israelis that still understand the beautiful history and not let it get, you know, muddled along the way. It doesn't matter whether you're secular, super religious, me, you know, right in the middle, but to lose something that's so a part of who we are, and that we make sure our children in America you know, don't lose that fiber. That's why we work so hard through Hillel's and other organizations that have, um, you know, popped up along the way. So I, I, something star I sometimes startle the learners. I, mean, I, I use the term learners because we work with a lot of different populations. And I say, I say there isn't, there isn't a Judaism. There are Judaisms, right? There are different ways of living a Jewish life and everyone's got to find their voice. And I think if Israeli Jews don't find their voice, don't identify what they do um, as Jewish, we're going to lose our connection with Jews who live outside of Israel. Um, so that's that's a big component of it as well, right? It's not there are lots of different flavors, and everyone's got to find and everyone's got to find their own. Um, and it's, it's anyone else? I'm sorry, I can't I can't see everyone on the screen. So if someone else wants to comment, that would be great. And if not, I'll I'm going to move on. Okay, so I want to share um, two more things before before we uh, tie it up. Um, I want to share one of my favorite quotes. Um, uh, um, it's it's a Bialik quote, Chaim Nachman Bialik, um, and um, I think of Bialik. I'm, I'm not a I'm not a Bialik. You know, I, I, don't, I don't specialize in Bialik, and this isn't a Bialik lesson. But I think Bialik is a prophet, and um, Israeli consciousness has kind of pegged him as a songwriter for children. If you ask people what did Bialik write, most Israelis will you know rattle off Nadnez, which is a, a children. Well, it's not. It's a very very uh, philosophical poem, but it's been kind of. Uh, it's been um, denigrated to a children to a children's song. So, but but in fact, Bialik has written wrote some very very powerful essays about uh, Jewish culture. And uh, Bialik, I don't know if you if you've heard if you if you study Bialik in depth, but Bialik instigated in the twenties in nineteen twenty six um, an institution which he called Oneg Shabbat, where religious and secular and all kinds of Jews would gather in Tel Aviv on Shabbat. For song 
liturgy, prayer, study. And, and, and it was a place where people came to together to celebrate Shabbat in an Israeli way that was very, very Jewish, but wasn't the same as, as what we do in, in traditional synagogues. Um, so one of his, sorry, um, the quote that I want to share with you, which I actually sent my son off to Mechina with this year, is part of a letter that Bialik sent in response to a question from uh, that, he, that was posed to him from a kibbutz up in the in the um, in the Jezreel Valley. They asked him how what should, how should we celebrate Shabbat or Pesach? Oh, it's eluding me right now. But they asked him how to celebrate. I think it was Pesach. Um, and he writes back to them. I want to read the Hebrew because it's beautiful, and the English translation is here. He says, "Chogu et avotechem." Feast or celebrate the festivals of your ancestors. Ve'hosifu alehem k'tzat mishalachem. And supplement them with a little of your own. As you see fit to your liking, to your abilities and circumstance. And I'm jumping ahead a bit. The important thing I translated it as don't be, don't be sassy. So renew. He says renew, rejuvenate, reimagine rethink, recreate, but whatever you do, tie it into Jewish tradition. Don't invent new holidays. Don't invent new rituals. Take the old rituals and recreate them, reimagine them, redefine them, reconnect to them. One of my absolute most favorite, um, most favorite quotes I have to say that one of one of our challenges, I think, in Tali in general, and maybe the liberal movements um, uh, at large, is to penetrate the Tel Avivian Israel. Right? People joke and say there's Medinat Tel Aviv, the state of Tel Aviv, which is very different from the state of Jerusalem. And I, I feel that we need to penetrate the state of Tel Aviv. And it has it, the state of Tel Aviv has it in its roots. Bialik lived in Tel Aviv, created Onig Shabbat in Tel Aviv, was very, very involved in, in, in creating the new city and the culture of that new city, right? Somewhere along the way, we've, we've lost something and, and we, need to re, we, need to, we, we need to recreate it. We need to grasp it. We need to, we need to um, breathe fresh air into it. And that's one of the biggest challenges, I think, uh, Tali education, I think all the Shechter, uh, Shechter um, um, Amutot on different levels face, we need to penetrate that society and we need to, uh, we need to be there. It's, uh, it's very sad for me that there's no Tali, there aren't any Tali schools in Tel Aviv today. And that's, I think, something that we need to, we need to set as a goal for the next five to 10 years. We have to have more education there. We have to have a presence there. And um, and uh, and we have to help recreate what Bialik started in 1926. Um, I need to leave. My battery is low. I'm so oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Diane. Okay, but it was great. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Okay. So I'm going to leave you, or we can we can uh, chat a little bit afterwards. But with um, this mosaic. This is a statue you might recognize. Oops. This is a statue you might recognize. It was created based on um, a picture drawn by Nahum Gutman, who's a, a very famous Tel Avivian artist. Um, it was commissioned to be set up right in front of the old Tel Aviv um, town hall. And it was like this whole, it was, it was um, a water fountain set in the middle of Tel Aviv. Uh, in front of the Tel Aviv Hall, actually right next to Beit Bialik, Bialik's residence. And um, the three paintings basically depict what Gutman sees as the history of Tel Aviv. And if you look at it, the history of Tel Aviv, according to Gutman, starts or includes the story of Jonah on the, on the left. The left panel is Jonah leaving uh, Jaffa running away from God, setting out, who, who sent him to Nineveh. It includes on the right are the 
uh, cedars of Lebanon that were brought in through the port of Jaffa to build uh, to build the temple, right? And in the center is a picture of modern Tel Aviv, of Achuzat Bayit, the original Tel Aviv neighborhood that kind of brings together biblical history, Jewish history into the new into the new um, city that was established in Tel Aviv. And around, you can't really see it in the in the uh, in this photo, but around there are different um, pictures from different points, the different biblical stories um, uh, that relate to um, that relate to Tel Aviv. And he intertwines three verses: one from Jeremiah, one from Jonah, and one from Chronicles that mention either Jaffa or Tel Aviv or the um, uh, um, the orchards. Right, Tel Aviv and Jaffa were known for the for the Jaffa oranges. So um, he intertwines verses from the Tanakh in this statue that was meant to celebrate the modern city of Tel Aviv. So I will stop sharing that right now, and I would love to hear from you all. If anyone has anything to add or ask, this would be this would be a great time. So I want to thank you all for joining and participating and uh, Carrie from Canada. Will this be recorded? Yes, this is being recorded. Yes. It's been great. I hope uh, we have other opportunities to meet in the future. I know that uh, Schechter is thinking of, is coming up with all these imaginative opportunities to study together online now that we've really gotten into this Zoom thing. Uh, over this past period. Um, I wish you all health and peace and justice and calm, not easy times we're living through. And um, I hope to see you soon. Toda raba. Perry, thank you very much. Perry. I must say that um, we live in French Hill, where the Tali school system started Achon. and so this is nachat for us over the years our 30 years here to see tali spring up all over yushalayim and it will happen in tel aviv i want to just put a plug in for strengthening what there is in yushalayim just because it exists here doesn't mean that it needs strengthening uh, we see we see the development we see the changes and um we need you Thank you. 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 Thank you